Okay, so um, so my title is um, perhaps a bit obscure to some people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by defining what a Fourier Mukai functor is, and then we can move on to non Fourier Mukai functors. And in fact, um, first of all, I want to give you a picture of a. Ooh, how do I? So I tried to do this earlier and it failed. And, and now I can't. Ah, excellent. Um, so here's a picture. This is a picture of a correspondence, which is um, um, a very classical operation in algebraic geometry. So we have two varieties, X and Y, and uh, their products. Uh, their product x plus y and in their product i've, I've um, drawn a sub variety uh, which is the blue parabola and so what the correspondence does is the following operation so we start with a point on x or more generally a cycle on x and then we pull it back to the product x cross y so this gives me the the yellow line, and then we intersect with the parabola. This gives me these two red points, and then we we push it forward to y, and this gives us a cycle on y. So this gives us these two points on y. Um, and um, so this is, um, as I said, this is a classical operation in, in algebraic geometry. But if you look at it in the right way. It's also kind of almost a Fourier Mukai functor. So Fourier Mukai functor is going to work in the same way. I'm going to define it on the next slide. It's going to have the same process of uh, starting from one variety, pulling something back to the product, uh, intersecting or tensoring with um, uh, something that lives in the product, and then integrating along the fiber to another variety. And the difference is going to be that instead of uh, cycles, we're going to be dealing with um, objects in the derived category. So here's the definition. Um, so Fourier Mukai functor is um, the composition of, of three things. As I said, you start with an element in the derived category of X. You can, if you're not, particularly comfortable with uh, derived categories, you can think of just a sheaf on X. Um, then you pull it back to the product, X plus Y. Then you tensor it with some other object E that lives in the product, and then you push it forward to Y. So even, so E could be something even very simple, it could be, a, of uh, something like we had before the structure sheaf of the sub variety. And that's the picture that I would like you to keep in mind. Uh, it could be, you know, the nicest locally free, um, whatever. Uh, this, the fact that we push forward this in general um, is not an exact functor. So when we push forward, even if we started with sheaves, we are going to get a complex in the derived category rather than just a sheaf. And so this idea, um, this is a very old idea uh, of uh, an operation like this. I gave you the example of correspondences because it's the most relevant for us algebraic geometers, but the name Fourier Mukai functor comes from, well, the inspiration was the Fourier transform. And so the Fourier transform, I didn't write it down, but uh, it's the same idea, right? So you start, with a function one variable. So now I kind of want to write it down and I'm gonna, <laughs> I think I'm gonna get it wrong, but uh, let's, let's give it a try. So you start with a function f of t and then you sort of have the same kind of operation of pulling back to the product. So you consider it as a function of t and x and then you multiply it by an exponential that's sort of the same, you know, in our world as, as, as correspond, this corresponds to a tensor. So the exponential is something like E minus IXT. 
just I feel like there's a pie. Anyway, something. Don't tell anybody. Um, and then uh, the third operation is, is integrating along the fiber. So I integrate this in dt and I get a function of x. Uh, so it's the same, so it's, it's the same process, it's just uh, a process in, in algebraic geometry rather than in analysis. Uh, so why do we like these functors? First of all, they are very concrete. You can really just say what they are. You just need to give an element in the derived category of the product and that defines the functor completely. Uh, and they're so concrete, you can even, I, I even drew one for you, which is not something you can usually do for a functor. And they're very well behaved. So, um, for example, we have very general formulas for uh, adjoint and compositions of Riemukai functors. Um, under some conditions, they preserve some notion of stability and so on. There's a lot that one can uh, do with them. And the third thing that I wrote there is um, that they live to enhance an enhancement of the derived categories. Of, but I have to explain to you, so this is kind of important uh, for us. So I have to explain to you what I mean by that. So let's do that. Um, so first of all, what's, what is an enhancement and why do we want it? Um, so the problem with derived categories is that um, they, in, in, in some sense, they are very nice and in some sense, they are not so nice and there's some issue with them. So one problem that you might have heard about, so I kind of want to move this out of the way, excellent. Um, one problem that you might have heard about is the slogan, the cone is not functorial. So uh, the direct category is an example of a triangulated category. In a triangulated category, you always have, um, you don't have a short, the notion of what a short exact sequence is. You instead have a notion of a distinguished triangle. And the distinguished triangle looks like this. And the idea is that this, this element C here um, uh, plays a little bit the role of, of both the kernel and the co-kernel. So we don't have either of these, um, but, uh, but we do have service substitute. And so the nice thing is that anytime you have a morphism like this in a triangulated category, but in our specific case, we're interested in, in derived categories. Um, so you can complete this to a triangle by taking what's called the cone of F. And this is this here is the shift. Uh, it's the shift where I just shift the complex by one. Um, and so the, the problem with this is that uh, this cone construction is not functorial, which means in particular, if I have another one, uh, so an amorphism uh, between these, there exists, there exists a morphism between the cones, but it is not unique. You have to make a choice there. And there is no way of making this unique on the level of the derived category. And this, as you can imagine, this is uh, quite annoying and creates a bunch of, uh, a bunch of issues. There are, um, there's a number of things you cannot do on the level of the derived category. So in general, for example, you may want to um, define something on generators and then generate the rest of the derived categories by taking cones, which you can do, and it's, a, it's very nice and it works really well. Uh, but you can't, if you define something on the generators and then try to extend uh, to, to everything else, then you run into trouble precisely because this cone 
construction is not functorial. And in general, there are a lot of things that you might want to be able to do that you cannot do on the level of the right categories. For example, you can't uh, comfortably extend uh, scalars. You cannot glue to the right categories safely if you just have data on the structure. You cannot take the limit of uh, a bunch of derived or triangulated categories and so on. Um, and so the way that people get around this is uh, they put some extra structure on a derived category or in general on a triangulated category in the form of an enhancement. So there's several notions of what um, kind of enhancement you uh, can put on a triangulated category or in our, in our case on a derived category. Uh, things you may have heard of is uh, the G categories, uh, spectral categories, stable infinity categories. Um, for us, we're gonna, uh, because we're linear over a field, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, all of these kind of situations and we can just uh, deal with the easiest situation, which is um, the one of, the, of a DG enhancement. So the DG stands for differential graded. Um, and this is the data of a differential graded category C with a canonical notion of cones such that if I date the homotopy category, we got back our original category DB of X. And so what we're doing is we're putting a little bit of extra structure on this um, derived category that uh, sort of makes things more rigid in a way that uh, forces the cone uh, to be more well-behaved on the DG level. So the picture that you should probably have in mind at this point is that you have sort of downstairs, you have the derived category of a variety and then upstairs, um, you have the corresponding enhancement. And uh, once you're upstairs, you can go back to downstairs by taking the home topic category. And when I said we can put an enhancement, I've, I really meant we can uh, with very mild conditions on this derived category. So as long of, of, the, of, of the variety X. So as long as the X is um, quasi compact and separated, this such an enhancement does exist. And And it is unique under very mild conditions that may be the same, um, or it may, yeah, sorry, I don't quite remember. Uh, but uh, any reasonable scheme will have um, an enhancement of its derived category and the enhancement will be unique. And these are results by um, Orlov and Canonico and Stellari. Um, so things work really well so far. So uh, we're happy. Um, the other thing that one uh, sort of must be able to check is, so we check that for, for objects, there's a perfect vocabulary. There's a really good correspondence between the downstairs and the upstairs. Um, but the other thing that one, should check is what happens to functors, right? So um, if I have another scheme of variety, Y, and I have its derived category, again, if Y is at all reasonable, um, there is going to be an enhancement here. And then the question is, does this, does there exist um, a, a functor uh, that lifts the functor F? Um, and so this is uh, sort of an important question because this is an important 
vocabulary, right? So this is the downstairs is where our intuition comes from and this is where computations take place. And the upstairs is where uh, occasionally you need to invoke the fact that the upstairs exists to make your constructions, your gluing um, and so on. And the question is, do we have a perfect vocabulary? And so before, um, so, well, another way to phrase this question is, um, if you have such a functor f, does there exist a lift? So this question can be uh, reformulated thanks to this theorem of Toen. This says that, again, um, under extremely mild conditions on x and y, um, the functors that can, so the functors that live downstairs but can be lifted to the upstairs, so a functor between two derived categories can, that can be lifted to a functor between two enhancements, these are precisely the Fourier Mukai functors that I defined before. So the, the very nice geometric functors where uh, what you can do is just uh, start in the derived category of x and do this. Uh, pull back to the product, tensor with something, push forward. Um, and so the question that I asked before is, uh, do we have a perfect vocabulary? So can we, for each uh, functor that we have downstairs, can we lift it to a functor between enhancements? So in other words, reformulating this, um, the question is, uh, is each functor between two derived categories a functor, a free Mukai functor? Um, and the answer is no. Um, so this is a result from a, a few years ago, which is there exists at least one uh, non free Mukai functor. So this is a functor between the derived categories of two the nicest possible smooth projective varieties. So a non-singular quadric and P4. Uh, it's an exact functor, but it's not a free Mukai type. So you can't, you can't uh, write it in the way that uh, we wrote uh, functors before as pull back tends to push forward. And so this is um, um, this is kind of a well, I don't know if it's a remarkable result, but um, so the thing that is um, what happened with with you know if you try and just write down a no free Mukai functor, it's really hard because anything that you do typically um, involves some you know, when you write down a functor, it involves some kind of geometry and all of the functors that, that you start and try and write down using some geometry um, turn out to be a Fourier Mukai functor. So for example, uh, pull back, push forward uh, can be easily written as uh, Fourier Mukai functors. The shift can be easily written. The shift is, is very nice, it's just, um, I can draw you the shift. So if I put y over here, then the shift is just, you take the structure shift of the diagonal and you shift it by one. Um, so yeah, so a lot of things you can do. Um, essentially anything that comes from the geometry uh, seems to be, as far as we still know, seems to be um, a Fourier Mukai functor. So the way that we constructed this passes by a non-commutative deformation of the uh, quadric. Um, and so there is um, there's a, a 
a composition of two functors. There's this functor between the Dirac category of a quadric and a Dirac category of a non-commutative deformation of it. And I'm gonna explain better uh, what this is. Um, and then, um, well, if you just write it like this, nobody would be really impressed because this derived category of QAT is kind of weird. And then you push her forward again to the derived category of P4. Um, and um, so this first part, this first part here is a very general construction. So essentially, um, for each uh, smooth projective scheme of sufficiently high dimension, so we need dimension at least three, you can uh, write down such a deformation and you can write down a functor that in a suitable, interpreted in a suitable way, it is non-free of Mokka. Um, but then, uh, so that's not enough, right? Because uh, this the D of uh, X eta. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk about this a bit more later. But this D of X eta is the derived category of an A infinity category, and so um, it doesn't really tell us what we need to know, which is how many non Fourier hunters there are. Um, And um, so in some way, you have to find a way to uh, push it forward like we did it over here um, to, to go back to the geometric world. And this is why, this is why, so this is, uh, well, one of the hard parts of the constructions is constructing this map in such a way that it doesn't, break the whole thing, right? So uh, if I were, for example, very careless and uh, after constructed this uh, complicated functors from the derived category of Q to the derived category of Q eta, I just sent everything to, to zero, that would be a free Mukai functor. So that I wouldn't have achieved anything. Um, but the claim is that um, well, the claim that I would like to make is that uh, most functors are actually non Fourier Mukai. So, most functors between two smooth projective varieties uh, are not so nice after all. And you, uh, in particular, they can't lift to a functor between two enhancements. Um, but this theorem is not really. In a way, it's not particularly impressive, right? Because it just gives one example, and uh, the you, you know you you may want to complain now because you're saying you should say well you know you have one example and now you claim that most functors are good like that. Where where does this come from? And so um, the reason for this well, actually, one of the reasons for this claim is that this construction is actually very general. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit later about why uh, this general construction can be uh, made to work in more examples. But uh, before we do that, I wanna talk a bit about, about this object over here. Uh, so what is that? So, uh, what that is, is a, um, it's a non-commutative deformation of, of X. So normally when we think about deformations of a skin, we're used to think about uh, geometric um, deformations of it. Uh, but in this case, what we're going to do is, um, we're going to think about a different kind of deformation, um, which is, obtained by um, sort of translating the data of, of, the, of X into a category that remembers enough about X. And then 
uh, deforming this category in the except shape that uh, we prefer in such a way that this functor exists. So we couldn't uh, do this because uh, for um, if we had taken just a geometric deformation of X, uh, the its the rep category would be complicated and we wouldn't be able to to construct this functor L. So we wanna uh, construct this this deformation in. Is there a question? Yes. Hi, Liche. Um, the question I have is what are the qualities that the non Fourier Mackay functor in this theorem have? Is that do you have some admissible subcategory in P4 for this quadric? Do you know where the exceptional collection is going? What are the qualities of this non Fourier Mackay functor? Yes. Is it just like completely pathological? Does it have any type of I mean, see, so yeah, so I haven't done this for an exceptional collection, but I do, I do, uh, so I can write down where an object goes, or at least I can put any object into a triangle, a distinguished triangle. Um, Yeah, but I, yeah. So, so there's no like admissible subcategory, like there's no theorem where you have like an admissible subcategory, like DBQ as a admissible subcategory of- Well, that, I mean, this, so there's a conjecture of Kuznetsov that says, you know, if that's the case, then the functor is Fourier Mukai. So oh. I- <laughs> <laughs> So, we, I mean, it is a conjecture, right? So um, I don't know. But presumably not. Okay, great. That answers my question. Thanks. Are there, are there any other questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a bit hard because I'm not seeing your faces. So I don't know if you look happy or sad. We have another one. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering uh, when you say like most functors are non free Mokai, is there a way to make that precise in terms of like? maybe having some moduli space or stack or derived stack of functors and that's like an open subset or something like that? Yeah, so uh, no, not really. Um, not yet, I should say. Um, but the, um, so the idea, the intuitive idea that I have is that for each, you should be able for each, um, for each, for your Mukai functor, you should be able to start from that and um, deform the functor in a non commutative way that's going to give you a whole bunch of non Fourier Mukai ones. Uh, so that's a little bit of a different procedure from what we're doing here. So here we're deforming this, this target, X eta. Um, but if you think about it, well, this is not actually math that has been done, but there should be a way of just starting for a, from a Fourier Mukai functor and, and deforming it um, in a way that gives you a bunch of non Fourier Mukai ones. But I don't have I don't have any. Well, first of all, I I can't claim that this is true because I haven't done it, and second, I don't have a precise claim of what that means. Okay, thank you. Okay. I actually um, had a question that's related with your former answer. So by what you were explaining your procedure, this also relates to, um, to his question about, um, yeah, the density or, so my question is the following. If you have a non Fourier Mukai functor between two categories, does this mean there isn't a Fourier Mukai um, functor between them? Uh, no, I mean, there definitely is, there definitely is a Fourier Mukai functor between Q and, and the, is this the question? So there definitely is a Fourier Mukai functor between the derived category of Q and the derived category of P4. 
Right. So, but this. So, what you're saying then is that this is the general procedure to produce non-free Mokai functors, and there are no other examples, or. So all the examples that we have right now of uh, non Fourier Mukai functors are obtained in uh, in sort of in this way. Uh, so you start with um, you start with this construction down here, which you can do essentially for. I mean, I wrote down smooth projective scheme, but actually, you don't even. Uh, probably need that. Um, and then you compose with something else uh, to get back to a scheme, to the derived category of a scheme, and then you take this composition. And if you played your card, there's, so there's um, a couple of ways to do that, and I'm going to talk about it later. And if you play your cards right, um, the result is not going to be uh, for Yamukai either, uh, and you have to be careful to not break anything when you when you compose uh, with this extra functor, right? Because if you're careless, you may end up going back to the Yamukai world. So you have to be careful about how you construct this composition. And so, um, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is um, there is essentially there's two ways that we know how to do this. And both ways give us infinitely many non Mukai functors, which is already a lot of progress compared to the one uh, that uh, we got in this original theorem. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let's start from uh, this guy here. So I have to tell you how uh, this deformation is constructed. Um, so again, as I said before, this is going to be a deformation of a category. So I'm gonna, and it's going to be a deformation of a category into an infinity category. So what I'm gonna tell you, uh, I'm gonna try and um, go slowly on that. So first I'm going to, uh, tell you what a deformation of an algebra looks like. Then I'm going to tell you what the deformation of a category looks like. It's going to be the same thing. And then I'm going to tell you what the non commuted de deformation of a scheme looks like. And it's all going to be pretty much the same procedure, just done. Um, it's a little bit more abstract and a little bit complicated, more complicated at each step. Um, so let's start with algebras. So this is the classical way that you deform a k-algebra using a, a bimodule. So the algebra is not necessarily commutative. Uh, so you start with a bilinear map into the module, and then you define the deform algebra as the direct sum of a and m. Uh, and I have to tell you what the multiplication is, and I called it m2 because later on, we're going to have several multiplications. Um, and so the multiplication is, so up to here, this would be sort of the untwisted way. So the, the, the trivial uh, kind of multiplication, but then I'm, I'm, I'm adding this, the extra semant, a of a b. Um, and so, um, if eta of AB is, is nice, this is an algebra, and it's, it's an associative algebra, not necessarily commutative. And uh, the result only depends on a class in Hochschild cohomology. So, if you've never seen Hochschild cohomology, well, all I'm doing is, well, there's a condition for eta. Uh, for this to work out correctly, and then I'm modding out by uh, some co-cycles. Um, so this is the classical way to deform an algebra. And um, then instead of, uh, so we can be a bit more ambitious. 
And just of taking, instead of taking a, a, a bilinear map, we can take a multilinear map. So from a, a bunch of copies of A, so this is N, N copies of A to M. And we can deform A in the same way, except that instead of getting an algebra, we get an A infinity algebra. So an A infinity algebra is, um, is sort of like an algebra that, well, something that would like to be an algebra, but isn't quite because it's not associative. It's only associative up to um, a homotopy that's called M3. And then um, you keep having, so you have um, all of these higher multiplications, M3, M4, M5, and so on. And they're all sort of what associative would mean for uh, multiplication on um, N elements up to uh, the next multiplication. Uh, and anyway, so the, the definition is a bit complicated, but uh, it doesn't matter so much in this case because this is really a tiny, tiny example of, of an infinity algebra. It's got only two uh, multiplications. Uh, of course, there's also a differential. Sorry, I should have said that. Um, so there's only two multiplications. There's M2 and Mn. And um, to do this, uh, we have a grading on our deformed algebra, deformed by infinity algebra A eta, that puts uh, A in degree zero. And then um, M is in degree, oh, did I do the shift wrong? Yeah, I did the shift wrong. Uh, this is n minus two, sorry. So m is in degree uh, two minus n, which means I have to shift by n minus two. Uh, so it's in very negative degree. And so multiplication is the usual multiplication that um, you would expect uh, where I'm using, so here I'm using the multiplication on a, and here I'm using the fact that um, M is an A by module. But then we have this extra data of um, um, mul um, another multiplication that takes N elements instead. And this just uses um, this um, this multilinear map eta. And so if if eta is nice, meaning if eta is a Hochschild uh, co-cycle, then this works out and this gives us the data of an infinity algebra. And again, uh, I, can, I can mod out by uh, co-boundaries. Yeah, sorry, I think I said co-cycles before. Uh, I can, so I can mod out by co-boundaries. Uh, and so this, the, the this uh, deformed infinity algebra really only depends on a class in the Hochschild cohomology of M. Um, okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is, are there any questions? Okay, cool. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do the same thing uh, for a category. So a category, uh, of course, this is something that you learn, I think, in undergrad at some point, and it seems like the coolest thing, uh, that um, a category is now just an algebra with many objects, or uh, on the other hand, so an algebra is just a category with one object where the algebra is the space of morphisms on this object, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use that and uh, do exactly the same thing that, that we did over here. So you start with a k-linear category in an A by module. So the A by module is just a functor. Um, and then uh, again, you have a multilineal uh, map or, well, really you want an element in the Hochschild uh, cohomology of M. Um, 
And then you can deform the category in the same way that we deformed uh, the algebra. So uh, for the algebra, we only had one object, which stayed the same. And in the same way, now the objects of our category will stay the same. Um, and what we did, we do is we define the morphisms. So again, the, we keep the morphisms of A, but we also add these morphisms coming from M that are again, they're shifted, they sit in very negative degree. And um, again, there's an infinity structure on this. Um, so this is going to give us an infinity category rather than an infinity algebra, which again is the same as an infinity algebra, algebra with many objects where um, instead of composition, uh, instead of multiplication, I have composition. So composition is just composition in A. And then uh, I also have to say how uh, these get composed and this comes from the structure of of M as an A by module. So that completely defines composition, that's okay. Um, and then we also have a composition of um, N morphisms in this uh, deformed category. Uh, and this comes from our eta. So it's defined like this, so. Yeah, I really should have said, I really should have put. Anyway, yeah. So that's what, um, so I'm doing the same thing. It's essentially really the same thing as in the previous slide. Uh, I'm just deforming the morphisms rather than, uh, well, before I had only one set of morphisms and now I have several and for each composable errors, I can play the same game and com compose N of them using this, this eta. Um, okay, so then the, the last step is going to be to do the same thing, except now we start uh, with a variety rather than just a category. And so of course the game we wanna play is um, start with the variety and associate a category to X and then deform the category in the same way that we've already done. And this you can do. So the construction of the category um, is not particularly interesting and enlightening. So you, you just take a, an affine covering of your variety and for each affine covering you remember uh, OX of of that open set. Um, and if you think about it, um, this, if you take the modules over that category, because uh, we remember what OX of, of U is for each U in the open covering, this is roughly um, um, the same way of the same, the same thing as, as remembering what pre is associated to the, the affine covering of X are like. Um, hmm. Okay. I, I have no idea why there's a blank space there, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so we can start this category, a chi or a curly X. Um, and then, um, so the cool thing about this is that the the, the geometric Hashi cohomology of, um, of this um, line bundle is the same as um, the Hashi cohomology with uh, where we think of uh, this curly X as a category and M it's, well, yeah, this should be maybe a curly M uh, because this should be this, um, so as I said uh, in, in uh, step one, there's a way to translate uh, the sheaves on X to modules over this category chi. And so, well, this, 
sort of the whole point of the way that this category chi is constructed is that there is this isomorphism of Hochschild cohomologies. And so now uh, we can take something in the geometric Hochschild cohomology and translate it to the Hochschild cohomology of the category. And so once we have something that Hochschild cohomology of the category, we can just deform the category as in the same way that we were doing it before. So it's going to look like um, there's going to be, um, well, so the, the objects are going to stay the same and then morphisms are going to have uh, a, a part in, in degree zero, which is going to be our original morphisms. And then there's going to be something in a very negative degree. Uh, and and the, in the min, in the middle, there's a bunch of, of, of zeros here. And so because of this very nice shape, um, where morphisms really only have uh, two, two kinds of, there's only two kinds of morphisms and there's a whole uh, bunch of zeros in between. And this is sufficiently simple for us to be able to uh, write down this kind of functor. And now I've changed my x eta into a chi eta because now we know what that is. This is this, is this kind of non-commutative deformation. And this we can do in general. So, so this works for any kind of smooth projective scheme um, of dimension greater or equal three. So there's a, there's a condition under Hochschild uh, cohomology for this to work out, uh, but it works out most of the time. So this gives us a ton of non-free and Mukai functors. Um, and now the question is, how do, how do we make these interesting? So to make these interesting, we want to compose this with something that goes back to um, a nice derived category of a smooth projective variety. Um, and um, there is, um, well, essentially there is two way that we know how to do this. Um, the first way is to uh, compose this functor L with a push forward to a reasonable variety in a way that works out nicely. So the original um, result that we had was so we had a derived category of Q into the derived category of, um, sorry, into the derived category of Q eta. And then uh, here there's some sort of uh, um, modified push forward. So, so you take, um, just the embedding of Q in, Q4, in P4, and you, you modified it a little bit so that it fits um, between the derived category of this deformed Q8 and the derived category of, Q, of P4. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, of course, this is hard um, because um, this functor is not necessarily uh, fully faithful, and then you have to sort of recheck uh, that the whole thing is non free of Mukai. Uh, the other thing you can try and do is you can start from dbx, modify it to db of x eta, and just embed it uh, into uh, something that doesn't break anything. So if you chose um, the second functor in such a way that it's a fully faithful functor that doesn't break anything and you're sure of that, uh, then if the first functor is non free Mukai, the whole composition is non free Mukai. And so this is uh, what we did. Um, so you take a smooth projective scheme, a dimension greater or equal three, and uh, we do need an assumption that T should be a tilting bundle on X. Um, and then you obtain an Ophria Mukai functor um, from dbx to dby. 
um, oops, yeah, okay. Uh, so I, yeah, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but before we move on, I also uh, want to talk about another result. This is my uh, PhD student's uh, thesis. He just defended two weeks ago. And so what he can do is he can make it work um, um, in a nicer way. So, so here we have, uh, a, we end up with a functor dbx to dby, but uh, we sort of completely lose control on this y. It could get uh, really, really big. It's just, uh, we know that such a Fourier-Mukai functor exists. So we, we do have, you know, we start with whatever we want uh, as long as there's a tilting bundle and then we end up in dby where y could be whatever we don't really get to choose that. Um, and so what he did is he ma managed to control the target as well. So he got a bunch of functors that are exact functors and they're not free and okay from dbx to db of uh, projective space for any, okay, uh, for smooth projective hypersurfaces such that um, there's um, a non-zero element in this uh, twisted Hodge cohomology. Um, and in particular, so things that I like about this are, first of all, um, you don't need uh, the requirement of a tilting bundle is not there. Um, so that's a lot, a lot more possibilities for what X could be. Uh, on the other hand, you do, um, well, it only, right now it only works for, for hypersurfaces. I think that he can make it work for more spaces. Um, and also uh, you get to control the target and also uh, you got a choice. So in principle, you got a choice to make a non free Mokai functor for each element in this. And let me show you what this looks like. Uh, so this is uh, a twisted Hodge diamond for a five dimensional smooth degree seven hypersurface with twist P equal eight. And in this case, the relevant Hodge number is this one, 20,993. So you do have 20,993 choices to make a Fourier Mukai functor. This could, uh, so you can't right now show that, I mean, some of these could still be isomorphic to each other. We don't know, but in principle, there is a ton of choices. So this is what I mean when I say most functors are not Fourier Mukai. This is the kind of thing that uh, visually, you know, tells you, oh, okay. Maybe that's true. Um, okay, and so let me go back. So that's, that's my student's results, so I don't want to talk about it too much. Uh, so let me go back to our results. So this uh, has the requirement of a tilting bundle, but it works for any smooth projective scheme that has a tilting bundle. And then um, you get a non-Fourier Mukai functor to uh, to be Y, where you lose some control over uh, the target. And so this works in the following way. So you take your tilting bundle on X, um, and then uh, you go to the target. Uh, the, the, this is the usual functor that we constructed before, this sort of prototypical non free Mukai functor. Um, and then you co-restrict to um, curve R, where R is just the endomorphism of uh, the image of T. So we, we're not so interested in the whole the right category of, of chi eta, what's really interesting is, you know, this is essentially the image of the functor L. So we're not, if we just cover straight to perf R, well, we didn't really lose anything. And this, 
this functor here uh, is still um, in some way an Fourier Mukai functor. And um, again, we have this uh, question that we would like to go back to the geometric world. And so uh, to do this, uh, what we want to construct is a functor uh, dBy, such, which is, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a scheme dBy such that um, uh, we have an embedding of perf R into dBy, which is called the geometric realization. So, so perf R is, is an admissible subcategory of dBy. So so because this is just an embedding into an abysmal subcategory, if this first functor is non free Mukai, then this whole composition is going to be non free Mukai. And the only question is, can we construct this geometric realization for perf R? And notice that, um, are is uh, so there's a, a bunch of results, especially uh, in particular by your love about uh, geometric realizations for algebras. This is not going to be an algebra in general, actually, it's never going to be an algebra, it's going to be um, an A infinity algebra. Because remember, in D of x eta, which have this extra uh, sort of morphisms in, in very negative degree. Um, and uh, the way you do this is, um, so this is a, was inspired by a result of Orlov on geometrizations of algebras using the Auslander algebra. So this is the, the classical definition of the Auslander algebra, which is like super nice algebra um, that has a lot of applications in particular has applications to uh, geometrization results for Geometric realizations be results for algebras. And um, so this algebra, we wanted to put it in a way that we liked. So you can write this as a matrix. And this matrix is uh, a little bit smaller, but is good enough for us. So each, so for example, the endomorphisms from lambda to lambda gives the lambda in the top right corner and so on and so on. And then you can do the same thing with an A infinity algebra equipped with a decreasing filtration, which is compatible with the A infinity structure. And this, um, you can write down exactly the same matrix where instead of uh, before you had the filtration with the Jacobson radical, and now just you have a filtration, which is compatible with the infinity structure. And um, this is, um, yeah, so now we, I mean, we could package all of this in an infinity algebra, but um, for technical reasons, uh, we want to package it into an infinity category instead. So this has um, n plus one objects, and then the morphisms are given by this huge matrix. And so it's not so important what the matrix is, the important thing is it works. So uh, you start with it, if you start with a finite dimensional infinity algebra, and you assume there's a finite decreasing filtration that is uh, compatible with the A infinity structure and such that the first quotient, so the smallest quotient has a geometric realization, um, then uh, you get a uh, geometric realization for perf R and that's, um, so you obtain this um, by composing two functors, you put perf R into perf of this big uh, Auslander infinity category of R that I defined in the previous slide. And this happens to have a beautiful semi-orthogonal decomposition into pieces that all look the same and they all look like uh, the smallest quotient perf R divided by F1 of R. And because we assume that R over F1 of R has a geometric realization. Um, 
And so we have N of these, and this geometric realization um, result uh, glues together. So this is a result of all of it that if you have of, of something with the same orthogonal decomposition and, and each piece has a geometric realization, you can put them all into a geometric realization uh, all together. And this is our scheme Y. And you can see how it's going to be a big scheme of, of much higher dimension, but uh, we can construct this in general. So in particular, uh, for our theorem, so you start with, again, smooth projective scheme of dimension m greater or equal three. You have uh, this Nofri Mukai functor from x to x eta. And how do you, um, and remember we can correstrate this to d of r. Perf. Um, so now you take, uh, where, where R is the endomorphisms of the image of the tilting bundle. Now, if you take a star of R, this is concentrated in degree less or equal to zero, remember, because there's just two types of, the morphisms are concentrated in degree zero and in degree um, two minus N. And uh, if you take uh, H zero of R, this is just the endomorphisms of T. This is because of the way that, this is one of the nice properties of L that um, um, H zero of, of uh, the endomorphisms of L of T is just the endomorphisms of X. Um, so in particular, this is the endomorphisms of Tipton bundle is certainly geometric. And so we can apply uh, the previous result that I showed you um, by using the sort of obvious filtration, which is just the filtration of the infinity algebra by the degree. Um, uh, so this is um, so this is the filtration, uh, and the first, the biggest quotient is precisely. H zero of R, which is the endomorphisms of T. So that's geometric. Um, and then uh, we have a filtration that's compatible with the infinite destruction. And so we can apply our geometrization result. Uh, this is going to be a composition. This goes, remember, into dB of the Auslander category, Auslander infinity category of R. And then uh, this has a bunch of, um, a semi-orthogonal decomposition with a bunch of uh, R series are equal to uh, H zero of R. And so because H zero of R is geometric, we can glue all of the geometric realizations to go back to dBy. So because uh, these are all embeddings uh, into um, admissible subcategories, this won't break anything. And so this functor, uh, this whole composition is not for even chi. And this gives us infinitely many uh, no free Mukai functors. In particular, there's a no free Mukai functor for each scheme with a tilting bundle. And I'm, I'm going to stop here and I'm sorry that I ran out of time. Thanks, Charlotte. Cool. Questions? Hello, thank you for the nice talk. Um, okay, this is not a serious question. This is a more of a coffee break question. But um, so do you think you can construct such examples by factorizing through uh, homological mirror symmetry? Because some people, I mean, like to think about the derived for Gaia categories as some, uh, I don't know, like a different, maybe the uh, homological mirror symmetry as um, um, and derive Morita equivalence between the formation organization modules and OX modules. So do you have the same infinity structure? 
So you factorize through HMS to get it, this infinity structure, which has the same flavor because it's a deformation organization module structure. And um, passing through this, you may be able to construct new examples. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot in a question. So, um, I mean, um, so for mirror symmetry, you have uh, some equivalences of the right categories, and equivalences are essentially all uh, Fourier Mukai. I mean, they're all Fourier Mukai functors. So, I don't, it, was that the question? Well, partly. I mean, I using using. I was um, just thinking about just the, the the thing you had in between. So factorizing through some some form of a homological mirror symmetry construction to construct such examples. So to get the thing in the middle, the infinity thing in the middle, um, to get this through through some uh, homological mirror symmetry construction. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so homological. So the problem is that um, so this this infinity um, the derived category of an infinity category that we have in the middle is constructed uh, ad hoc in such a way that um, we can construct this functor. So uh, you have so you start with dB of x, and I mean this uh, in principle you could put all sorts of uh, deformations here of, of, of X. You can think of geometric deformations, you could go through mirror symmetry and so on. But the hard part is constructing this functor. And so to construct this functor, uh, you really need this derived category to be uh, of the right shape so that we can apply our result. In particular, our result uh, relies on the fact that uh, the structure of, of morphisms have um, this sort of structure where you have this chi in degree zero, and then um, and then you have something here in degree two minus n, and then here you have a bunch of zeros, um, and these zeros they're really important for us to make this construction work. And so if you just try and substitute this, this X eta with something else, that something else, I mean, this is sort of the minimal example of an infinity uh, category that we can construct. And the something else, um, I mean, if you try and do something, you know, potentially more reasonable, you risk uh, getting rid of these zeros here that we really need for our construction. We could. You know, in principle, you could put more stuff, more morphisms over here, and that would still be okay. But these zeros are really important for us, so uh, so that would be quite tricky to to uh, to do this in another way. But on the other hand, yeah, I mean, long term, I hope to be able to uh, to do something uh, something like that without passing. Uh, by this guy, but but I haven't done that yet. More questions, Tyler. I I apologize for this really stupid question, but I but it, this is some very embarrassing thing. So, um, so you have a DG enhancement from Kananaka Stellari or like from Orlov, right? That's unique. But then you make this non-commutative deformation using make, using higher products of the a infinite, like making a new a infinity algebra, right? How how the, how does a DG enhancement relate to higher products? Are are they related? Uh, yeah. So I mean, um, you can think of I mean, you, instead of taking a DG enhancement, you can take an a infinity enhancement, and that's essentially the same thing, right? That That's why I'm asking. I don't. The, the right is you're not going to get the right from me. So, <laughs> it, what, what, what is what, like? Uh, okay. What? <laughs> so, so let me give you a, a result uh, for this. Um, so uh, essentially, um, 
the infinity formalism and the DG formalisms are the same in the sense that for each infinity category, there exists a DG category such that the infinity category is infinity quasi-isomorphic to that DG category uh, and vice versa. I mean, yeah. Um, and, and vice versa, I mean, a DG category is also an infinity category. So they're really sort of the same thing. It's just that um, a DG category is easier to define, but it's not necessarily easier to work with because an infinity category has a lot more um, um, flexibility built in. For example, we can add this, this, this kind of morphism that we wouldn't be, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do as, as, as readily in a DG category. So in other words, this thing that I wrote down, you can write down this, uh, yeah, actually you can write down this so-called DG hull, which is just this derived category, sorry, this DG category that is infinity quasi equivalent to it. And in fact, our construction used to, uh, uses that, passes through that secretly, uh, but, uh, but you don't have to, but because yeah, because the formulas are the same. So, uh, so that's the reason why I sort of uh, I've been breezily passing between the two. Maybe I should have mentioned this. Yeah, sorry. This is just me missing a gap. Like, and, and then when you make this x eta, you're just changing the a infinity product structure on the derived category. On the on the on the on the category, and then I'm on taking the category. the category. Right. Okay. Thanks. More questions? You may have mentioned this in passing, but where does the argument break down when you are in dimension lower than three? Uh, right. So in dimension lower than three, we can't make this gap uh, big enough. Um, because, um, so, uh, so ma to, to make, uh, this gap into a big enough gap, we need, um, um, we need, um, some, um, the Heta to be in a suf sufficiently high HH. -H. Um, so, so this is the Hochschild Hoch cohomology condition you mentioned, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so you have HH of XM, and this is where the eta lives. And this, um, um, I'm not gonna manage to do the computation uh, right now, but essentially you need, um, you need the gap to be uh, bigger than the global dimension of of x, uh, and that um, and the Hochschild dimension of x is twice the dimension of the variety, and so these two things together work out when the dimension of the variety is at least three, so that then you get an eta in H H six. All right, thank you. More questions and and two minus six is uh, by the way little known fact two minus six is equal to minus four so you get precisely a gap of three here so that works out and that's the first the first dimension of x for which that works out okay any more questions okay let's thank Alicia again thank you very much.